Well, good morning. Some of you know who I am. Some of you may not. My name is Jeremy Twombly. I'm a pastor at Cow Creek Community Church in Redding, California, which now most of you probably know where that is because uh, we've been on the news for the car fire. It's been happening this last week. Many of you contacted me who knew me and knew I was up there and uh, where it said you were praying for us as a church body, and we really do appreciate that. It's been a, an ordeal, but God has been gracious to bring us through. It's good to be back and want to bring you greetings from my church and just to express my gratitude to be here with you and, and to see the Lord's work in your lives as well. I've been preaching through the book of Genesis to my congregation, and uh, so I thought that what I would do this morning is actually preach... Um, from two of my favorite chapters in the book of Genesis, uh, indeed in the whole Bible, Genesis 1 and 2. And so let's turn and let's begin by reading together Genesis chapter 1. And remember, as you read, this is God's inspired and inerrant word. So let's read together. Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse, and it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruits in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. 
In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Amen. And we'll stop there. That's a text that we're going to cover this morning. And let's pray and ask God's blessing on it before we get into it together. Father, as we read your holy word this morning, in Genesis chapter 1, we simply ask that you would illumine our minds to understand it, and soften our hearts to receive what it teaches us, what it reveals to us. And Father, we pray that we would be nourished and strengthened by it in our souls this morning. To any lost person in this room, I pray that the revelation of your truth regarding our origins and purpose would be to them like a light going on in their hearts and that they would come to understand the truth and even be led to faith in Jesus Christ this morning. I pray that you would take me up by your spirit and help me to explain this text truthfully and powerfully this morning, we pray for your namesake. In Jesus' name, amen. When Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, beginning with Genesis, his intention, it seems was to teach the nation of Israel where they came from, who their God was, and how they fit into God's plan for the universe. And of course, knowing these things would then equip them to live as God's people in a world full of other great nations who worshipped other gods. And you see, in a sense, the first five books of the Bible, including the book of Genesis, which Moses has written, should have the same effect upon us, shouldn't they? They teach us where we came from, who our God is, how we fit into God's plan for the universe. And of course, like the nation of Israel, knowing these things will equip us to live as God's people, in a world full of other great nations of people who worship other gods. Perhaps no chapter in the first five books of the Bible is more effective in achieving uh, so much of this purpose all at once as Genesis chapter 1. In this, what can only be called spectacular chapter, we are told the story of how how God, how our God created the universe in its entirety in the beginning. And as it teaches us, it instructs us regarding truths about who our God is, about the universe that we live in, about us as mankind, truths which are critical to helping us to live as God's covenant people in the world. This morning, I want to begin by walking through the text of Genesis 1 and trying to explain as best I can what it means, and then I'll attempt to draw out the message it teaches us and how it applies to our lives today. So first, let's walk through this first chapter together and consider what it means. The chapter begins, of course, with those famous words that most of our children know by heart, in the beginning. And as the chapter unfolds, you realize that this is the story of the real ultimate beginning, the beginning of the universe. And in it, we see that God reveals 
to us how space and time and matter all came into existence and how they came to be ordered as they are now. And the summary answer is given there in the rest of verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How did the universe come into existence? It was created by the God revealed in the Bible. The rest of the chapter then goes on to tell us how he did it. It begins in verse 2 with uh, the earth already created, but as it says, formless and void. That is empty and without order, uh, chaotic, waiting to be molded and shaped like a lump of clay. But there we see, hovering over the face of the waters, the text says, these waters that covered the earth, formless and void, ready to bring order, ready to bring life, was the Spirit of God. Whom, of course, as Revelation continues to unfold in the Bible, we're told that he is himself one of three eternal persons of the Godhead. The rest of the chapter tells us how God brought order to the earth and how he filled it with life over a period of six days. Now, God certainly didn't need six days to create and order the universe. Rather, he chose to do it in six days for a reason which is tied in with the weekly pattern of Sabbath rest that you see revealed there in the beginning of chapter 2. But what I want to point out this morning is that as you look at these six days, as they are revealed to us here in Genesis 1, we see that there is symmetry and there is beauty to these six days of creation. So for instance, on the first three days, he ordered the universe so that the earth would be suitable for life. And then, generally speaking, on the second three days, he filled the universe with various living creatures. And as the days unfold, you see that there's even more specific correspondence between days one through three and days four through six. So if you imagine this chart up here, on, on day one, God created the light and separated it from the darkness. And on day four, God created lights in the sky, the sun, moon, and stars to regulate the day and night upon the earth. And then on day two, God separated the waters, creating an expanse called heaven above the earth and seas below on the earth. And then on day five, he created birds to fill the heavens and fish to, and other sea creatures to fill the sea. And then finally on day three, God brought forth dry land upon the earth and, and filled it with vegetation. And then on day six, we see that God created living creatures to dwell upon the earth, upon this dry land, including animals and mankind. And in this way, you see, day one corresponds with day four, day two corresponds with day five, day three corresponds with day six. And then, to take it one step forth, further, you can notice as you read through that beyond this overall symmetrical structure, there are several repeated patterns that emerge throughout these six days of creation. So the first pattern has to do with the way God created. Each of the six days, we hear the words, God said followed by a command for something to come into existence, such as uh, famously, let there be light, and then followed by the phrase, and it was so, or some equivalent to it. In other words, in each of the six days, God created and ordered the universe by his word. He simply spoke, and it happened. The second pattern has to do with the, the nature of what God created. And at, at the end of each of the first five days, we're told that God saw what he had made and what? It was good. And then, strikingly, at the end of the sixth day, having created the entire universe, it says, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. The third pattern has to do with the relation of God 
to his creation. So on the first three days, you see that after creating various things, God went on to give them names. So after he created the light and separated it from the darkness, on the first day, he went on to name the light day and the darkness night. And after separating the waters to create an expanse above the earth, on the second day, he went on to name that expanse heaven. And after gathering up the waters on the earth to form dry land and seas, on the third day, he went on to name the waters sea and the dry land earth. Now in the Bible, in the Old Testament, the right to name things in this way was an exercise of authority. And in this case, it reflected God's rule over his creation as king. So patterns regarding the way he created, patterns regarding the nature of what he created, patterns regarding his relation to his creation. And fourth, there's patterns woven into the narrative that have to do with the climax of God's created work on the sixth day. So in verses 3 through 25, of course, God ordered and he created the heavens and the earth and everything in them on five successive days following a very similar basic pattern. But then in verse 26, in the middle of the sixth day, God made one last creature. And as you read the narrative, you notice many aspects of the narrative in this section indicate that this final creation is special. So first, the description of this final act of creation is, first of all, we just notice it's far more lengthy and detailed than the description of all the other things that he had made before this. And then second, uh, this final act of creation, we notice that the writing form changes at uh, a, a particular place as it describes this final act of creation. It changes from simple prose to elegant poetry. In other words, the text literally just breaks out into song, as it will. And then third, many of these recurring patterns, which I mentioned before, which had characterized the account of creation in the first five days, well, they suddenly change in the description of this final act of creation. So for instance, instead of saying, let there be, God, as it were, deliberates with himself and says, let us make. As a side note, I, I happen to believe, I think that this might possibly even be an early hint in terms of progressive revelation of what we see later on in the scriptures, that there is a plurality of persons within the one Godhead. But also, instead of seeing that his creation was good, we see that when it comes to this last creation, this time we see that it says that his creation was very good. And then fourth, this final creation is described as having a nature and a purpose that is evidently superior to the rest of the things that he had created. For instance, only mankind, male and female, is made in God's image and commanded to rule all the other creatures of the earth. The concept of mankind, male and female, being in the image of God refers at its most basic level to the fact that God made them, mankind, male and female, to be like him in various ways. And hence we can see there are things about men and women such as intellect and personhood and morality and language and creativity that evidently reflect aspects of God's own nature as he was revealed to us in scripture. However, there's also reason to believe that the very phrase, image of God, refers to man's special role in the earth. That is, the role that God gives him to be his vice regent, to rule as his representative upon the earth. And of course, these two aspects of what it means for man to be in the image of God are related, aren't they? It is mankind's likeness to God in various ways that qualifies and enables him to be God's special vice-regent over the earth. 
in the end, we see that everything God made on the first five and a half days was designed to be, in one sense, the environment for this special creature which God made at the end of the sixth day. The fifth pattern that we see in the narrative has to do with God's purpose for his creation. You know, at several points during the, these six days of creation, God explicitly declares the purpose which his creatures were to fulfill, a purpose of his own design. So in verses 14 through 18, we're told that God created the sun, moon, and stars to rule over the day and night by giving light upon the earth in their turn. In verse 22, God blessed the beasts of the earth for the purpose of multiplying, filling the earth. And in verse 28, God blessed mankind for the purpose of not only multiplying and filling the earth and also subduing it, but also then ruling over it in his stead. In other words, God created everything in the universe to function in a particular way for a purpose that he has designed and determined. The sixth and final pattern that we see in the narrative has to do with the provision of God for his creation. So throughout these six days of creation, we see that God in his goodness provided all that was necessary to sustain life, the life of his creatures, over time upon the earth. So first he gave light, then he gave water, and finally he gave food for both animals and for mankind in verses 29 through 30. And notice that the food that he gave to them was plants and their produce. There's no mention of eating meat at this point, probably because, simply because death has not yet entered into the world. Rather, as it says in the last verse of the text, that at this point the creation as a whole is very good. Well, hopefully that gives you a snapshot overview of this first chapter of Genesis and, and helps you to understand what it means. But now I want to attempt to draw out the message of Genesis 1 and how it applies to our lives today. To begin with, I want to state the obvious. I mean, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out the main message of this first chapter. He, in this first chapter, we are being taught as the community of God's people in every generation that our God, that is the God revealed in the Bible, is the one who created the universe out of nothing. And he did it to be a perfectly good environment which mankind would rule over in his stead as his image bearer. And the implication of this message is that God's creation would then bring him glory as it is enjoyed by his creatures who fulfill his purpose and intention for them. But as we reflect upon that main message, as we begin to dissect it, we see that there are several truths which emerge from it, which have massive implications for us as God's people in terms of how we think and how we live our lives. So first of all, let's consider the implications of what Genesis 1 reveals to us about God. Genesis 1, for instance, quite obviously rejects the notion of atheism, which is quite popular in our day and is growing in popularity which, when taken to its logical conclusion, just smashes and destroys things like meaning and morality and beauty and truth and dignity. And we see here that instead, Genesis 1 affirms what is actually quite obvious for those who have eyes to see it, that there is indeed a God with whom we have to do, who is the source of meaning and morality and beauty and truth that we see all around us in the universe. But more than that, Genesis revealed that this God is not some impersonal, uh, buzzing oneness that pervades all of reality as in the pantheistic and panentheistic Eastern religions like Hinduism and Buddhism. Rather, Genesis 1 reveals that our God, the God revealed in Scripture, the God who created the universe, is a personal being who, for instance, speaks, let there be light 
and wills. Let us make man in our image and makes moral judgments and God saw that it was good. And Genesis 1 also reveals that God is distinct from and transcendent above everything else that exists because he made it all. As John put it, John chapter 1, verse 3, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And from this we derive the truth, which is so clearly articulated in the rest of the Bible, that this God is the only God, because everything else was made by him. There is a creator, and everything else is creature, and they are distinct and he is transcendent above his creation. There's nothing that existed alongside him for all eternity. Why? Because he created the universe in the beginning out of nothing. Think of the words of the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 11 verse 3, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen is not made out of things that are visible. Along these same lines, Genesis 1 teaches us that God has not only created the universe, but has provided and and continues to provide for its ongoing sustenance. So we see in the text, he provided the sun, moon, and stars to establish ongoing patterns of light and darkness and seasons and times. He provided vegetation that would reproduce and bear fruit for food according to their kinds. He created animals and mankind in such a way that they would procreate over time and be sustained and fill the earth. And he repeatedly throughout the text, blesses his creation. He blessed both man and beast so that they would be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Indeed, what we see as Revelation continues to unfold is that God daily sustains the life of his creatures. You remember Paul's words in Acts 17, 25, he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And again in verse 28, in him we live and move and have our very being. In addition to this, Genesis 1 gives us revelation of just how glorious the nature of the one true God, our God, is. As I mentioned previously, we see that God is personal as he speaks and wills and commands. We see also that he alone is eternal, since he alone existed before the beginning of all things and is their source. We see that he is omnipotent in his power as he simply utters a command, and then out of nothing, things come into being. Let there be light. Let the earth sprout vegetation. Let the waters swarm with living creatures, and the various components of the universe respond to his command and and come into existence we see his unfathomable wisdom on display as he puts the universe together according to a perfect design. We see his abundant goodness as he finished creation and he called it very good. And we see his free graciousness as he gave his living creatures everything that they needed to live and flourish upon the earth. And perhaps most profoundly, we see from Genesis 1 that the one true God who created the universe is the God who is progressively revealed in the rest of the Bible and not some other God talked about in some other holy book. And as the creator, God is revealed in Genesis 1, of course, as the ultimate owner and ruler of the universe. In this capacity, we see him rightfully determining the order of the universe and defining the purpose of each of his creatures. So, by his design... Light is separated from darkness. Waters are separated from waters. Land is separated from sea. By his design, the sun, moon, and stars are to function as signs and for seasons and days and years and are to rule over the day and night. 
by his design that the birds are to live up in the sky, the fish are to live in the sea, man and animals are to live on the dry land. Thank goodness there's no sharks on dry land. (laughs) It's he who determines the nature and the purpose of mankind, whom he has made in his image to take dominion over the earth. You see, as the prophets would later say, God is the potter. And to expand their universe, their their metaphor, the whole universe is his clay. God is the king, and the universe is his domain. We live in God's world. He owns it. He rules it at his pleasure. As the psalmist said in Psalm 90, verses 1 and 2, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein, for he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Those are some of the implications of what Genesis 1 reveals about God. But now let's consider the implications of what Genesis 1 reveals about the universe. You know, in in contrast to secular cosmologies, which suggests that either the universe randomly popped into existence out of nothing, or really the only alternative, that the universe simply always existed, Genesis 1 reveals that there was a time when the universe did not exist, and that it ha- at a specific point it came into being not randomly with no known cause, but because the God of the Bible created it out of nothing. And over against the theory that the universe became what it is now through a random process of evolution over time, guided by nothing other than the principle of natural selection, well, Genesis 1 reveals that the God of the Bible created the universe in the beginning in the same basic form that it is right now with plants and animals designed to reproduce, what does it say? According to their kind. And we see that this mind-boggling complexity that we observe in the universe, this breathtaking beauty that we see, the undeniable meaning evident in the world and its creatures, it all reflects the wisdom and the beauty and the purpose of the God who made it the God revealed in Scripture. As the psalmist so eloquently put it in Psalm 19, verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. And contrary to the atheists who suggest that the universe has no objective purpose, since it's, at the end of the day, simply the product of time plus matter plus chance, Well, Genesis 1 reveals that the universe does have a purpose. But the purpose of the universe in Genesis 1 is not derived from itself, as if the universe was inherently divine and worthy of worship in and of itself, like the New Agers and other Eastern religions suggest. This, Paul says, in Romans 1.25, is to exchange the truth for a lie and to worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. Instead, the purpose of the universe, according to Genesis 1, is to bring glory to the one who made it, ultimately, who alone is worthy of worship. Thus the psalmist cries out in Psalm 148, verses 1 through 5, Praise the Lord, Yahweh, from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His hosts. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you shining stars. Praise Him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for He commanded and they were created. Finally, Genesis 1 reveals that we can't look at the corruption in our own nature or at the corruption in the world around us and complain at God for making things this way. Because according to Genesis 1, He didn't. According to Genesis 1, when God created the universe in the beginning, it was all very good. Rather, as we see in Genesis 3, it was human sin that ultimately brought corruption upon God's good 
creation. It's an important truth for us to let sink in. The ultimate blame for evil and suffering in the world rests on mankind's shoulders, not God's. Those are some of the implications of what Genesis 1 reveals about the universe. And now, let's consider the implications of what Genesis 1 reveals about mankind. You know, unlike secular environmentalists who want to minimize the difference between man and other animals, Genesis 1 reveals that man is unique in that he alone was made in the image of God. Indeed, he is the image of God upon the earth. Every creature has value. As Christians, we should affirm that. Why? Because God made them all. But mankind does have greater value than the rest because God made man in his own image. This is why, by the way, we all just intuitively know that if our house was on fire, and that metaphor is more real to me after this past week, if our house is on fire and we have only time to save one thing inside, it would be a grievous evil to willingly choose to save, you know, the house plant or the house pet instead of a human being. And it's because man is made in the image of God that he has inherent dignity that must be respected all the way from conception to death. So to take a human life without the permission of God, is an assault against God himself and is worthy of death according to the scriptures. Genesis 9, 6, whoever sheds the blood of man by man shall his blood be shed. Why? For God made man in his own image. It's for this reason that a woman is not free to have her unborn child killed and the terminally ill are not free to end their own life Because God made us in his own image, and he alone has the right to do with our lives, therefore, according to his own will. Genesis 1 also reveals to us that it is God who made man male and female. You know, that simple gender binary, which is reflected both in our anatomical structure as well as in our genetic structure, that's from God. And as we see, he has designed us this way for his own good purposes. Namely, companionship and procreation and marriage. All to reflect his gospel truth. And thus, according to Genesis 1, for for human beings to reject the gender God has given them from conception and to try to give themselves a gender of their own choosing... It's not only futile, I mean, you can't really do it, but you see, it's also rebellion against God, and we need to face that. Finally, it's become popular to think of men and women as autonomous beings who have the right to determine their own reality. Isn't that crazy? Including our own identity, our own morality, our own purpose in life. But Genesis 1 gives us sober and clear truth that that that's rebellion against God, which as we see in the rest of the Bible results in destruction in this life and hell for all eternity if we do not repent of it and if we're not saved of such blasphemous way of thinking and living. Rather, Genesis 1 reveals that That the God revealed in Scripture, the God who made us in His own image, has the right to tell us who we are, how we should live, and what our purpose is in this life, because we're His creatures, His special creatures, made in His image. And what He says in this regard is that, are you ready for the meaning of your life? We are made in the image of God that we might reflect his character in the world by obeying his commands and that we might rule the earth in accordance with his will as his vice regents. This is God's original purpose for humanity in all of its glory. 
Those are some of the implications of what Genesis 1 reveals about mankind. And brothers and sisters, if we reflect upon these things as Christians, some things become very clear in light of this chapter. If what Genesis 1 says about God is true, then he is to be worshipped instead of any other creature, because he's the creator of all things. He is, as Romans 1 indicates, to be thanked as the ultimate source of every good thing. He is to be praised because of his glorious character, and he is to be obeyed because he's the king. If what Genesis 1 says about the universe is true, then the universe is not to be worshipped. Oh, in it we see a reflection of the glory of God, but, but it itself is not to be worshipped, but rather it is to be used in accordance with the order that God has given it and according to the purpose that he has assigned to it for his glory. And if what Genesis 1 says about man is true, then we must begin deriving our identity, our morality, and our purpose in life from God's truth revealed in Scripture, rather than from, you know, the ever-changing ideas of fallen man's darkened mind. And in addition to all this, as we read Genesis 1, we're enabled to see quite clearly, aren't we, that something terrible has happened to God's creation. The created order no longer is perfectly good as it was in the beginning. And mankind has fallen far short of the glorious identity and purpose which God created him to fulfill according to Genesis 1. This is what Paul's saying when he says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And this is where we need to realize that Genesis 1 is only the beginning of a much larger story. It's a story which is told in the rest of the Bible, even as it's a story which is unfolding in reality, in history, even right now. And what's beautiful is that the beginning of the story told here in Genesis 1 actually establishes a pattern which will be repeated at the end of the story as well, such that it prefigures it and points toward to it. To put it simply, the story revealed in the Bible, the story which is actually unfolding in history, begins with creation, and then something terrible happens, and it ends with new creation. So the first words of the Bible are, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the final pages of the Bible contain these glorious words in Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heavens and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And did you know at the center of this story, this story of creation moving to new creation, is the person of Jesus Christ. It's it's amazing when you read Genesis 1 and then you go and read John chapter 1. The opening words of the gospel of John speak of Jesus saying, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Do you see, in the very language of Genesis 1, the Apostle John describes Jesus as both God himself, and in terms of the triune work of the Godhead, the agent through whom God the Father created the universe in the beginning. God created the universe through his word in the beginning? Well, Jesus is the word of God by which God brought the universe into existence in the beginning. And just as God is described in Genesis 1 as creating light out of darkness by his word in the beginning, 
Well, so the Apostle John goes on to describe Jesus Christ, who he, dis, who he assigns as the Word of God, as, as bringing light into the world, now darkened by sin and death. And so we read in John chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, he says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. How did Jesus bring the light of life into this sin-darkened world? Well, ironically, the one through whom all things were made, who brought life to the world in the beginning, entered into the world that he had made. And he became a man taking on a human nature. And he lived the perfectly righteous life which fallen man had failed to live. And then he died the death as sinners that they deserve to die in their place. And then having plunged into our darkness and, and defeated it through his death, Jesus rose from the dead and ascended to the right hand of God where now he sits and offers forgiveness and eternal life and new creation to all who will repent and believe in him for salvation. I think of those words of Paul in Colossians 1, 15 through 20. He says, he is the image of the invisible God. That's Jesus. The firstborn of all creation. Not a creature himself, but preeminent over all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. There's that redeemed humanity. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Now, if you're here this morning and you have not done so already, I would urge you to believe in Jesus Christ as the Savior and the Son of God who has come to reconcile all things by the blood of His cross and that you might receive the reconciliation that He provides by repenting of your sins and owning them before God, all your rebellion and filth and repenting and turning to Christ that you might cry out to Him for mercy, for forgiveness of sins and that you might be reconciled to God. He will do that for you this very morning. Repent and believe in Jesus and you will be saved. And now we, we have put our trust in Jesus. The amazing thing is that we have already begun to experience the first fruits of the new creation. As the Spirit who hovered over the waters in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, has taken up residence now within our souls to renew us into the image of God from one degree of glory to next as we are united to Christ by faith. And so the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, new has come. This is what is happening in us, brothers and sisters. Christ is being formed in us by the power of the Spirit who sanctifies us. And that reality, brothers and sisters, must now shape the way that we live our lives every day, knowing that we belong to the new creation that is coming and not to this present evil age. Our old man has died and we now live in newness of life in Christ. And the Spirit of God is renewing what was lost by reforming us into the image of Christ in our character. And yet as we experience the first fruits of the new creation now by the Spirit, we also groan, don't we? Waiting 
for Christ to return and to consummate the work that he started to bring that new creation into its fullness at the end of the age. This is what Peter talks about in 2 Peter 3.15, but according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Brothers and sisters, I hope you know that hope, that precious promise, is part of what enables us to persevere through all the trials and sorrows and struggles of this present evil age in which we still live under the curse. Well, in conclusion, as we study Genesis 1 this morning, I hope it's had the effect that Moses intended when he penned it centuries, millennia ago, so that we might understand these fundamental truths, where we came from, who our God is, and how we fit into his plan for the universe. You know, this first chapter of the Bible, brothers and sisters, it, it provides us with basic building blocks of a biblical worldview. And I don't know about you, but it's so clear, isn't it, that these things are no longer assumed in our society. And so we're faced with a challenge are we going to believe these things? Or are we going to take the ever-changing opinions and philosophies of human beings, darkened in their mind by sin and its corrupting influence? I pray that you will receive the teaching of Genesis 1 and that it will provide the foundation for your worldview and that line upon line and precept upon precept, you would teach it to your children and you know what? When you evangelize and you tell other people about the gospel, you can't assume these things anymore. You have to start here. This is how they will understand the gospel. And so I pray that this will help you to do that as well. Well, I pray that God will take these things and bless them to our souls this morning. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that you who alone were there in the beginning have not left us in the dark about our origins. Father, we know that these things are like food and drink to our souls. Without them, we're lost. We're set adrift. We don't know who we are. We, we don't know who you are. We don't know what the purpose of it all is, but you have anchored our soul by showing us these truths in your word, and we pray that they would be foundational to our view of life and ourselves and you and that, that that would have a solidifying and strengthening and maturing effect in our lives we pray this father that as we have recognized that we are your creatures who live in your world and take our cues from you that we would be reminded as your people once again of these things that you would be at the center and that we would live for you in submission to your word. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.